All right, so as a reminder, what we talked about, well, first of all, for those of you who want to fix the quiz you just bombed, um, remember the Grace Cookout today. <laughs> so I did my part, right? <laughs> so it's like, it's like, let's give an impossible quiz, and now you need to replace this quiz with a 100% quiz grade. So show up to the Grace Cookout, um, and I confirm this is the correct spelling of Regents Atrium, um, and we're doing skeet shooting and uh, sand volleyball, bungee jumping. Oh, just the skeet shooting. What's up? Yeah, at the chapel, top of chapel. Yeah. Or how about bungee-less jumping? I was on campus one weekend last. Uh, uh, last year, it was must have been early in the fall when it was still nice outside, and there was, I guess this is this new, I, I assume it's a new, newish thing, where you like build your own tightrope. He's a kid that does that. Yeah. Every day after class. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, he was that. Well, I, I don't know if it was that same guy, but uh, he was out there with Amish. Or, you know Amish? Yeah, Amish is one of our seniors in computer science. Um, yeah, they were doing tightrope and. And I was going to try it. And apparently there's some weight limit to the rope. Doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, uh, yeah, so is that a thing? Are we doing tightrope walking at the... I think it's called slacking. Slacking? Yeah. Are we doing slacking? Slacking. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. So, just the skeet shooting. That's the only... Right, just skeet shooting and, and sand volley. Is it now actually is the skeet shooting is that gonna kinda double as like the sand volleyball portion of it? Is that gonna be like uh the pod racing in Star Wars with the, the sand people that sit up on the dunes and fire at the so like the sand volleyball are we gonna get shot at with skeet people? So like when they say pull that means serve. <laughs> All right. So, if you want to take your life into your own hands, show up to this grace thing, you get a free quiz. Um, all right, and then, again, reminder, senior, senior seminar presentations start tomorrow. Uh, you also get extra credit if you come to at least two of the presentations. That's one hour of your time, and tomorrow is Pharmacy 08, 2.30 to 6.45. And let's see here. I can tell you who's presenting tomorrow and if any of them are interesting or if I would avoid. Why would you do that? Because I heard the professor told me to avoid you. Huh? I heard the professor told me to avoid you. And somebody asked, so why are you avoiding me? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. 240. Uh, yeah, this one will probably suck. This one will definitely suck. Um, this will probably suck. Yeah, I'd have low expectations. This one could this one could be kind of cool. Um, it's a, a smart mirror uh, based on a ra Raspberry Pi, so you go up to it and you know it has calendar events and stuff like that. So, but you can also see yourself in it. So it's a that he built one or created one. So that could be kind of cool. Um, I know this one's going to suck. Uh, yeah, he was in my office the other day asking a question that was like something like freshmen should ask. Yeah, that's not going to go well. Uh, this could be kind of interesting. Uh, Conkle is doing a thing on Kali Linux. So this is kind of like, um, security hacking type thing, like different things that IT professionals can do to, um, secure network, but almost looking at it through the, the lens of, of a hacker. So how do hackers break into systems and that kind of stuff? So that, that has the potential to be somewhat interesting. Uh, let's see. Then Thursday. Uh, this one shouldn't be bad. This is an Alzheimer patient mobile app thing for like reminding them for things and communicating with families. Um, uh, this one might not be bad. Um, 
it sounds boring, but apparently it's gone pretty well. This uh, a, a new site for the speech pathology department. Um, this will look pretty cool. Uh, Sam Miller used the Unreal game engine to basically create a, a like a shooter, first-person shooter type game, and uh, um, I don't know. There was some questionable talk at their practice presentations of him having the uh, the default enemy is a bunch of Ku Klux Klan members, so I'm not sure what to expect from that. So you could have a police type of situation. Um, let's see. This one could be kind of interesting, um, depending on how well it went. But uh, um, you know, there's some apps out there, like an example of an investment one. It's called Acorns, where you connect your credit card uh, uh, to it, and what it does is it, let's say you spend a buck ninety-two, it rounds up eight cents, and then it invests that in the stock market. So you're just rounding up pennies, but it adds up over time. Um, but he's doing this for donations to charity. So basically, it rounds up, you know, a like couple of cents on your your credit card transactions and gives it to St. Jude. I think it's the only one he has it working with. So. He has it working with Wells Fargo credit cards and St. Jude is a charity. So kind of proof of concept. Um, uh, this one's kind of cool on paper, but I bet it will suck pretty bad. Um, so it's kind of socializing wait time at restaurants. So uh, kind of there's two sides to it. The um, owner of the restaurant uh, if they have don't have a very long wait, they can encourage people to come into the restaurant uh, by sending out push notifications. But if they do have a long wait and they still want people to come and get in line and wait, then they can do like bar specials and stuff like that to encourage people to say, oh, I'll come and drink for two hours and then finally get seated. Similarly, uh, from a consumer perspective, consumers can um, basically put in, you know, when they show up for a wait, they can put in what the current wait time is there. So it's, uh, you, you get kind of real time information ish on uh, wait time. And that also then encourages the owners, the more you're complaining about the wait, the more the owners are encouraged to give good deals. Um, let's see, this is a hunting tracking app for hunters where family members can kind of track where they are in the woods in case they don't come back. Um, they can find out where the bear attack happened. Um, so that's kind of what, what that guy is. Uh, locating hunting parties. Uh, oh, and this one could be kind of cool. I don't know how well it's going to end up being implemented, but um, it's for paying street vendors with like PayPal, where a street vendor can put up QR codes. Like if you sell hot dogs on the street, you can just have a QR code thing set up there where somebody can come up scan it and automatically pay them with PayPal um, and not you know that you don't have to move cash around and that kind of stuff so possible interesting one uh, so that's this week and then um, uh, the last day senior the the final exams next week which is 310 to 525 on in s120 on the 10th um, this one should be pretty good. This is going to be our new attendance system here in the department, where in each room you'll come in with your ID card and just scan it. Uh, there's going to be a Raspberry Pi inside of a collection thing, which will then go to the cloud so we can see what attendance is and and it'll detect what time your classes are and all that stuff. So that should be kind of cool. That's only in computer science. We're beta testing it here, and then we're going to roll it out to the whole. Well, the idea is that if it works here, then the whole university might be interested in it. Uh, let's see. Uh, then Amish. Amish is doing a uh, um, smartphone motion controller uh, for games. That can he's got an uh, artificial intelligence neural network for detecting um, gestures. So the idea is if you you know draw a circle in the in the air with your phone, what's likely a circle, and then what's likely you just moving your arm or something like that. So being able to detect gestures with a uh, motion controller on your phone. Um, that has the potential to be kind of cool. More than likely, it's probably going to detect one or two gestures as kind of a proof of concept. Uh, let's see. Um, this one could be kind of cool. I, I haven't seen what her uh, Minecraft mod is yet, but kind of uh, how do you benefit special needs kids through a game like Minecraft, but doing mods for the game. So that could have uh, some potential neat things. 
this is a Slack bot. Um, so you remember our Slack Slack communication channel. Um, so uh, Haxton is uh, really talented, probably our biggest underachiever in the department. Uh, I haven't seen him in class in weeks. Um, but in any case, and he also stood up his hackathon team. <laughs> he's really bright. Um, so <laughs> he's creating a, uh, um, uh, a Slack bot that, uh, like, among other things, there's, it'll, uh, whenever there's bad language on Slack, it'll flag it, remove it, and then that person gets kind of reported to the department. Um, let's see what else is it doing currently. Um, well, I think that's the one example he gave, but I think it does some other things. It allows you to do some like real-time programming inside of Slack, where if you want to create almost a Slack bot for yourself, for, like responding to private messages or something like that, you can. So he's doing some Slack modification type stuff. Um, so that's that. And then if you want to stick around and come on <laughs> Friday morning, uh, Ryan Guy will be giving an exhilarating uh, thing for the website he probably didn't build in Korea for a deaf and hard of hearing um, I don't know, organization, Dealy Flippy. I think it's just bringing all their web forms and stuff together in one place. I wouldn't waste your time. So that's, <laughs> that's the senior seminar presentations, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, but, you know, I would say come to a bunch of them and, and uh, support your your uh, classmates, but keep low expectations on the ones I told you to keep low expectations on. But that does give you the opportunity to make fun of those people, right? Because you have questions and, you know, if somebody asks, if they, you know, at the end they ask, you know, do you have any questions? You could just say, yeah, what the heck was that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I encourage you to like berate them, like try to embarrass them on stage. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not like officially offering that, but it will benefit like everybody when I'm grading, if I'm in a good mood. Just the Burlington Yes, encouraged. Okay. <laughs> Do I? Yeah. Well, I'm the teacher of the class, so. <laughs> I, I do go to all of them. They'll, I'll actually miss about a two-hour chunk uh, tomorrow because my uh, uh, wife has a follow-up doctor's appointment. I have to go with her, too. So, But I'll leave, and then I'll come back. Uh, I think that's like uh, 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock or something like that. I'll be gone. But there'll be other faculty member there, faculty members there to take notes and let me know how bad stuff was. I'm leaving during a good window where things are likely going to suck. So that's good. Actually, oh, actually kind of sucks because I wanted to see this one. Yeah, I don't care about these. It's a waste of time. This would be good. I should be back for that. I've already seen this. It's not good. It's a shame I'll miss this one, too. I'm interested in that. All right. So you guys will have to show up to those and take notes. All right. So, again, pitches for things, but make sure you come for the free food today and skeet shooting. Um, so we were talking about synchronous versus asynchronous communication last time. That is uh, blocking, uh, which is what we've been experiencing through our re recursive calls. Uh, versus non-blocking uh, a background thread. Uh, let me go ahead and open Eclipse. So we just started talking about the concept of threads. All right. So I effectively turned this into a quiz. Um, which has significantly higher weight on your final grade than a single homework assignment does, by the way. So this was better if you thought about it. Um, okay, so uh, we were looking at a ghetto solution to waiting here until both sides have been sorted if the calls uh, above did not block. Um, so if we were able to make those guys not block, we currently can't. You know, I haven't, well, some of you might be aware of it, but I haven't taught you how to multi-thread those. How do we make those guys not block? So conceivably, if these guys did not block, how could we prevent this from happening while still allowing all of our merge sort calls to kind of, you know, keep, keep getting called to sort those, those portions of the list, okay? But only until their, like, this guy right here, our merge step, cannot continue until 
the two portions of Merge Sword Helper that he's reliant on have finished. Okay, that doesn't mean that all calls to Merge Sword Helper uh, block everything. Just the just the window that this guy's interested in. That is, he's interested in when B1 to E2 has been dealt with, right? All right. So, what possible solutions based on what you know right now could we use here? Assuming that I could call this and then I could call this and it get dumped out right here while that's still cooking, how could I prevent myself to move on here until these two guys are done? What are some ghetto solutions? This would be the stuff you wrote down on the paper, which I did warn you would probably be bad solutions, and that's okay. Uh, What do you mean not zero? Um, equal to zero. So you want these guys to return some value? Okay. Um, so you do you want them to actually return a value? Do you want them to like set some value? Set some value. Okay. Um, where would that? So you wanted to set a value somewhere that we could view right here. So the idea was this guy uh, maybe when he first starts the value starts off at one. Let's just say. And when this guy starts, the value starts off at 1. And we can't move on here until both of those values have been set to 0. That's what you're proposing. Wherever that value gets so stored, basically, we spin this off in some thread, some non-blocking way this guy gets called. We spin this guy off in some non-blocking way. And then we come here and we basically run into a wall. The door's locked until those two values get set. All right, so... Kind of a historical solution to this type of problem is, is so if we were to, you know, the, the ghetto solution to this thing would have been something known as busy waiting. Busy waiting. All right. So busy waiting would effectively be something like, um, let's using your example here, I'll just put this inside of a multi-line comment that way. Um, Java doesn't complain too much. Might be saying while um, lock one is equal to one and lock two is equal to one, while they're both not done, twiddle my fingers. Basically, do nothing, right? Okay, so you're just sitting there, you know. Are they still both one? 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 Over and over and over and over again, knowing that you're still getting more work done than you would have gotten done otherwise uh, because these guys are handling both sides themselves, right? Now, if you kind of think recursively for, the, for a moment and you decide that, okay, well, both of these guys are, uh, um, you know, both of these guys are responsible for dealing with their half of the list, well, those guys at some level are going to eventually have to do this stuff. They're going to eventually have to do a merge, right? So these, this busy waiting is going to have to exist at every level through here, right? Okay, so each time we call merge sort helper, there has to be kind of a unique lock number set up, a unique, uh, um, if we talk about this in a uh, um, systems programming perspective, this lock variable is usually something called a semaphore. Okay, so uh, a semaphore, in fact, let's actually put this in our, in our notes. This is more future thinking type stuff. So we have this concept called IPC. This is inner process communication. Okay, or in our case, we're going to be talking about threads uh, today and um, uh, Wednesday. So, inner thread communication. So, these are programs running on your computer that are running independently of each other. How do they talk to each other? All right, and one of our forms of inner process communication um, uh, is something called a semaphore. So, a semaphore is a specialty integer 
that increments and decrements atomically. Is that atomically? Oh, there we go. Okay, increments and decrements atomically. And what it means to be atomic that it happens as if it only took a single CPU cycle. Okay, so kind of what we talked about in here, one, it happens as if it was one magic trick that the CPU could do. All right, so it took the minimum amount of time that a CPU could, uh, um, uh, could do something. So a lot of times you might think of this as uninterruptible. Ah, whatever, let's just assume that's spelled close. I'll throw a couple more R's in there and that's probably good enough. All right, so it's uninterruptible. Um, so this kind of comes back to this idea of something known as a race condition. All right, so race conditions are when we have two processes, two or more processes, let's say, who are all trying to access the same thing at the same time. All right, so you know, let's say that you and I are running for that door. Okay, and we literally both get there at the same time. You know, you there's a button on the other side of the door that when you hit it, the door slides shut. All right, but we literally get there at, at the same time or close enough that we actually both get through the door before it slides shut. Okay, but let's say whatever's on the other side of the door is only for one of us, whoever was the winner. Well, in this case, you have two winners. That's bad, right? You know, whatever it is, it might be bad to have two things accesses at once. You know, the example I would usually use in class would be, you know, like if, let's say, McDonald's, you, you go in during the lunch rush and there was only one register open. What if everybody went up to the register and started ordering at the same time? That would be bad, right? All right, so, you know, it's bad enough when one person is ordering. Because <laughs> the chance of, of uh, accuracy is low. Um, <laughs> uh, so, in any case, uh, what do we do? We human beings have self-policed ourselves, right? We've designed this idea of a line. You know, have you, have you ever considered that? Like the behavioral patterns at McDonald's? There's no thing set up that says, here's the line. Taco Bell has that. And Taco Bell has the little care of it. No, not McDonald's. It's a wide open space. Let's see what the people do. <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, we've self-policed ourselves by saying, okay, we get in. Somebody's currently using the resource I need. I'm going to go ahead and get in line. So, you know, I'll, I'll wait my turn. Right, that's that's the way uh, we we've, we've done things. Well, semaphores are effectively a bouncer that would stand up by the register and only let you pass when it's your turn. So, if we had a version of a semaphore at McDonald's, you'd have you know a dude in there probably. I'm guessing McDonald's semaphore would be a guy with a whip. Doesn't that make sense? It doesn't make sense. Well, it makes just as much sense as skeet shooting at a barbecue. So you came up with that. <laughs> She's just giving up arguing. It's like, look, it's a waste of time, clearly, because he's just going to invent another thing we have that we don't have. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, it's obviously a guy with a whip. Probably Ronald McDonald with a whip. That would be creepy, actually. Like, or the Burger King. I mean, the Burger King guy? Yeah. That would be actually scarier if it was the Burger King guy in a McDonald's with a whip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder what, actually, they probably wouldn't do it. They wouldn't care enough. But what would a McDonald's person do if somebody dressed up as the Burger King guy came in and just kind of just like loitered in the lobby? <laughs> He's handing out the, the King hats. <laughs> to, to McDonald's patrons. That face is creepy. Like, I'm gonna like the Burger King person. Yeah. Always smiling. Yeah, it's true. Have you seen the commercial where he, apparently he's running for office? Yeah, he's up against some senator guy that doesn't exist either. He's running on the platform of uh, what dollar dollar ninety nine chicken nuggets or something. Like dollar twenty nine chicken like cheap chicken nuggets. But not McNuggets. Nuggets. McNugget is, I'm sure, trademarked and whatever. It's stuffed. There, there's stuff associated with that. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, we have this idea of a race. 
How do you go from race condition to Burger King guy with a whip in McDonald's? That's classic Lippman class. <laughs> so, so in any case, we need to have some way of, of policing a resource. You know, in, in our case here, we want to police this section of code. This would usually be called the critical section. So this is equivalent to our uh, register at McDonald's. That's the thing we're protecting. Don't let anybody access this code here until the gatekeeper has let them through. Something along those lines. Make sense? All right. So we would protect that. That's, this is this idea of a, uh, uh, well, the idea of a race condition is what is the problem on the semaphore um, solves. So if two people come into McDonald's at relatively the same time and you got the Burger King guy with the whip standing there and he's only supposed to let one of you go by, if, he, if his actions aren't atomic, which uh, obviously we all know Ninja's actions are atomic, but other fighting styles are not atomic, so you might be able to squeak. It might be made up partially, partially but... Um, and I don't think ninjas use whips either, except this guy. Uh, but in any case, uh, if he was atomic, if you and I both got up there at relatively the same time, it would literally be impossible, from a machine perspective, for both of us to gain entry to the register. One of us would win. Somehow. Okay? Because that semaphore is atomic. All right, and then the other person would be forced to wait in line, and he can keep checking the semaphore, asking the Burger King guy, is it my turn, is it my turn, is it my turn, is it my turn? He's only going to let you through when I have finished and release the uh, register, if you will, release the resource. Because what ends up happening is, getting back to the idea of a semaphore where it's an integer, we set that integer's max to the total number of resources that we're protecting. In this case, if you have one register, it'll be a one. So... As long as it's a zero, the door's open. So when I go and I increment it from zero to one, that's atomic. So you can't increment it from zero to one at the same time as I'm incrementing it to zero and one because it happens in exactly one CPU cycle, one magic trick on the CPU. So one of us is going to get that magic trick in first so that when the other guy tries to increment, it's not going to allow it. It's not going to let you increment because it's already out of one, and that's the maximum number of resources it's protecting. So you can keep trying to increment it over and over and over again, but not until I'm done ordering will I decrement it, which will then allow you to increment it and get, get through the door. Make sense? So that's how a semaphore, semaphore works in general. So understand that in inter, inter process communication, we kind of have a whole bunch of things like this that allow protection of those resources. But now, this guy needs to operate on something. So even if we put a semaphore in there, okay, we, even if we, ooh, what a, I don't know. Oh, I actually improved the spelling. It's fine. Um, so even if we put a semaphore in here, we have to have something, someone, who's going to try to access it. All right? So what would we do? If we had a semaphore right here, this is our bouncer. So here's our busy waiting. That's the old school bad way of doing this. And um, they used to also use this type of thing uh, for timing. So, um, you know, like let's say that you wanted something to happen in a video game in three seconds. Well, you might decide how long does it take to count from, you know, what, what number do I have to count to for it to take about three seconds? Something like that. Okay. Um, and this was how old programming happened. You know, so getting back to kind of the evolution of programming, um, there was a video game that uh, when I was a kid was popular in the, uh, the, the arcades, as when that's when those existed. Um, <laughs> I played Super Mario Brothers 3 in the arcade. <laughs> that doesn't seem like an arcade game, does it? Yeah, that was in the arcade. That was weird. You just feed it quarters. And you had that, that, once they found all the whistles, you had that one kid that could play the whole game on a quarter and just pissed, pissed you off. You just stood there. You had wait in line. You know, we needed the Ronald McDonald uh, Burger King whip guy. Um, but in any case, a popular game that was in the uh, arcade was a game called Double Dragon. And, uh, um, and my brother and I were so excited when uh, Double Dragon came out for the PC. 
Not today's PC. <laughs> the old x86 <laughs> DOS 1.1 <laughs> version of the PC loaded off of the true floppy drive, <laughs> you know, the, the five and a quarter inch floppy disks. So we installed it on our computers. It was an old Epson, Epson computer. Um, they made printers. <laughs> this was a computer. Um, what's up? Yeah, imagine what their computers were like. Actually, I think they were one of the first uh, uh, companies that were making computers that consumers actually had. Because um, back then, everybody was trying to do home computers and just try it out, right? Um, in fact, we talked about it earlier in the semester. That was an important part of the history of Apple, was the that Xerox gave up on personal computers. They had a computer, the Xerox Star, and decided, ah, real money's in copy machines. Um, well, I mean, Xerox has done all right. You know, so. Really? Well, maybe they haven't done so well. <laughs> you got what? Well, well, I mean, I'm more thinking that they stooped to the level of hiring you. <laughs> oh, you were a Xerox warehouse guy. I got you. So when you say worked for Xerox, what you're really saying is you carried boxes of printers. And copy machines. And did do forklift, probably, right? No, I'm not saying forklift. <laughs> yeah, I don't trust <laughs> So what, what did you do? Um, did you put stickers on stuff or something? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> two summers ago, we actually replaced all the printers and all the aurora Oh, so you, I thought you said you worked in a warehouse. Yeah, but then part of that, like, on the other end, I'd go to the truck and install it. Okay, so you, you were like a delivery guy who also did setup. So you were kind of like equivalent, like when you buy a TV from Best Buy, who then sends out a group who put it in your house and hook up the wires and stuff like that. So not just Neanderthal. Like one step up from, what is that in cosmogony? What do they call those people? I know Dr. Locklear has a, the, the whole series of, well, I mean, I, I've heard of it. I don't know what his teachings are on it. My understanding is that there's several different kind of classifications of, of humans, and they were all intelligent, but that they were all contemporaries of, of each other, which I'm fine with. But I think that, so calling you a Neanderthal doesn't mean that you're stupid, but I mean it that way. <laughs> but you got to set up, you set up printers and stuff. Makes sense. Anyways, what I was getting at here, <laughs> how did Double Dragon go? Well, <laughs> it's actually not a hard stretch to make fun of him, but that's okay. I feel like always the fall guy. Well, I mean, every every class has to have a fall guy. I mean, you're outgoing. That's the you've opened yourself up to it. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, the idea is when we when we first got this game for the old x86, it was awesome. Game was just like the arcade. Um, worked great. I mean, the controllers we had were a little suspect. They didn't, you know, you didn't have like legit companies that were competing over who makes the best controller back then. You had like the controller <laughs> you could buy for PCs. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was cool. Well, uh, a couple years later, we got a brand new computer cutting edge. It was like a 486 DX2, 66 megahertz, um, processor i mean we had to wait for them to release the chip i think it was more than a couple years maybe four or five years later um but we went decided hey let's go back and load this old game back on there so we did that game was unplayable completely it loaded but every all the bosses and stuff all came out at once okay because they implemented the timers with busy weights well that old x86 computer it might have taken 25 seconds to count from one number to another number. Not on the new bleeding edge uh, time machine computer. <laughs> it took no time whatsoever. So everything just came out all at once and your guys moved around the screen super fast because even like the timing between steps, like as your guy moved, was done with busy weights. Yeah, so very, very, very bad programming practice, but was fairly common uh, back then. But as good programmers, we're not going to stoop to that level today. All right, so the replacement for a busy weight here would be a semaphore. 
let's say. All right. And who's going to access that semaphore? Well, this guy is going to have, uh, we, we have a door that comes here, right? Well, here's two guys that have to do work and we can't access a resource um, until the, both of these guys are done. All right, so probably what we would end up doing is we'd end up setting a semaphore that has two uh, resources that it protects. Allows them to count up to two. This guy increments it to one, this guy increments it to two. This guy here can keep trying to increment it, but he's not allowed to increment it to a three. Now the issue here though is, is how do these guys make sure that one of them doesn't decrement it until it's done? That, that makes sense? So this guy is going to try to get through the first door. So maybe he's allowed through one door when this guy is um, at, uh, at zero or, or at, at one. And then when it drops down to zero, he can get through the second door. So maybe this guy here decides, I'm going to try to decrement the semaphore twice. I want to grab both resources in order to do my next job to get through the door. So we'll have a semaphore that allows two resources at the same time set up here. These guys will grab that semaphore twice, make, locking the door. This guy here will keep trying to open the door, but he'll have to open it twice. We'll have, you know, increment, increment, two in a row before we actually let him into this code. That makes sense? But each version of this call to merge sort is going to have its own version of that semaphore. That makes sense? So what we'd have to do is we'd have to pass in to merge sort helper that semaphore. So those, those guys can bring it with them like luggage onto an airplane. So they would have access to it to decrement it when they were done. Okay, so down here at the bottom, they would decrement the, after they finish their merge step eventually, they would decrement the semaphore that they brought with them onto the plane, if you will, uh, by one. They would also lock when they made their semaphore when they made their calls here, they would lock a local semaphore that they had. So you have all these semaphores floating around. Every call the merge sort would have two semaphores associated with it. A local one that was meant to be used to lock the critical section, our merge step on this page. And then the global one, the one that whoever called merge sort helper sent in so that the guy from the next step up could eventually get through the door. That makes sense? So that's one way we could handle this if we had this specialized tool called a semaphore. All right, kind of makes some sense. All right, so let's start talking about threads as a starting point here. So before we can even think about protecting things that way, um, so just understand that semaphores exist. Okay, before we can even think about that, we need to have the capability of doing things in a non-blocking way. Right now, we only know how to do things synchronously. What if we need to do things asynchronously? So we have this thing known as a thread. Okay, so really it's the thread class. Now the thread class implements something called runnable. Okay, runnable is something known as an interface. That's what kind of animal runnable is. All right, so let's talk about what an interface is. Okay, now these are really object-oriented terms. Sometimes interfaces in other languages are called protocols. It's a you know interchangeable term, but an interface is a set of fields and methods that must be implemented by implementing classes. So that is to say, back here with our thread, a thread implements the runnable interface. Now the runnable interface dictates at exactly one method must be written. That one method is public void run. All right, and if I show this to you in the documentation,
to to Let's go down to threads first. There in java.lang. So here's our thread class. Okay, notice that this guy implements something called runnable. Okay. Um, so this guy implements something called runnable. If I click on runnable, Runnable dictates a single method, run. All right, now inside the thread class, we have a top secret method that is a final method. So let me go back here to uh, the thread class. We have a method called start. All right, so here's the start method. This guy causes this thread to begin execution. Uh, the Java virtual machine then calls the run method of this thread. And because this thread implements the runnable interface, if we write our own thread, we are forced to implement the run class or the, the run method, which is the method that the start method will call. All right, on the Java virtual machine's uh, behalf. So the virtual machine knows about its implementation of threads and will do the necessary magic to spawn a brand new thread that runs asynchronously, runs separate from the current thread, the main thread that our program is running on. All right, and it will do whatever our run method says it should do. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what that guy's going to end up doing. So that's the run. Uh, that's the thread class. Thread class implements something called runnable. It's an interface. We have to do uh, public run, uh, uh, public void run. We have to implement that. That's what that thread does. And then finally, call start method when we want a we want to asynchronously. call the run method of this thread. Make sense? All right. So what we'll do next time is we'll actually write a thread that does something. I'll probably call it like worker B or something like that. We'll have it doing things in the background so we can see these guys running interchangeably and we'll look at how communication can work between these threads. All right. So uh, no homework for next class. There might be a quiz on one of these things or something like that, but I want you to be able to mentally prepare for the Grace Cookout. Mesquite shooting especially, and also the senior seminar presentations. Is this a bring your own gun thing? Or? Uh, you have to ask the coordinator. Because I don't think we're supposed to have those. Uh, yeah, no guns, but you can bow and arrows. Bow and arrow? Okay. Yeah, I think that would make some sense. Can we have nerf guns? So just imagine the hours you would have spent on the homework assignment I would have given you when you now have free time to come to the senior seminar presentations and the Grace Cookout. These are all things you should take advantage of to stay in my good graces, pun intended. Ah, get it? All right. I will see everybody on Wednesday.